a bit better what they are and how we observe them and what we learn by studying them, right? Okay, so I am assuming that you all have some basic understanding of what is radio astronomy yes. and what is a radio telescope, how it works, you've been to GMRT also and you've had enough lectures by now, right? But as you say, you've not had much discussion on, on pulsars and neutron stars, right? Okay, so is this the full strength? Anybody more expected? No. Okay. So, uh, what we do is uh, we talk a little bit about introductions. What are they? And how they were discovered? How we study them? And then we talk about some of the interesting things that we learn. And I don't know if we'll have enough time to do everything in the time available. And so there's be some parts which I may go through a bit quickly some parts a bit more slowly and uh, we will see. Okay. So, uh, first is how are neutron stars born and so I think most of you know that stars come in different masses and, uh, and uh, sizes and uh, how a star evolves through its life history depends critically on its mass. Right? So, if you study how a star like the sun evolves. Uh, versus how a star which is much heavier than the sun, for example, 8 to 10 times the mass of the sun uh, evolves, then they are quite different. Uh, are you aware of these kind of things? Yes. Right? Okay, so uh, stars like the sun have a very fairly sedate um, life cycle in terms of what happens to them, but more massive stars, uh, they go through a fairly dramatic phases of life, right? And um, the, they, of course, they burn up the fuel much faster <laughs> than the sun does and uh, then they go through um, this phase where the, the it becomes red giant and then later on uh, there is what is called a supernova explosion, right? Are you familiar with supernova explosion, right? So, in a supernova explosion what happens is that the core of the star uh, collapses and at that point, what is the main constituent of the star when it reaches that stage where it collapses? Anybody? Mainly helium. Why helium? Because it has a bond of its hydrogen. Like, or even higher metals. Yeah. So depending on initial mass. Depending on how initial constituent. Well, what does it depend on? When when should it stop? Why not depending on the initial mass. The size of the star. Stops at iron, right? Right? And you all know the reason why it stops at iron, right? Okay. So. Uh, uh, and, and the outer regions are blown out into a supernova explosion from the rebound of the uh, collapse. Okay? And uh, this is what we call a supernova remnant, which again you would have seen pictures of and maybe you would have uh, studied a bit about it. So and uh, yes? So that in, those images uh, are they in the uh, variety of spectrum or just in optical? Or yeah, they are. Right? So this is, for example, an, uh, an optical image of the Crab Nebula. Uh, this is a uh, X-ray image of a supernova remnant where we discovered a pulsar right at the center of the GMRT, and this is a radio image of a supernova remnant, right? And they were put there just to show that they do emit in different energy bands. Sir, yes. Uh, does a first-generation star also uh, produce those higher materials? Such high uh, July. What do you mean by first-generation star? It, that's formed only from uh, hydrogen. Yeah. Why uh, shouldn't it? Other why shouldn't it produce the higher metals? Be, uh, like because <coughs> when it starts from only hydrogen with a very low metal content, it will uh, not reach have that temperature to uh, reach all those uh, higher metal stage. Uh -huh. It it may uh, happen that it reaches carbon, then it gets destroyed, then forms some metals again. New stars from uh, form with an certain yeah. initial so metal. There are various signs of uh, second order complications oh. that may arise. But the basic point is that if the initial star is heavy enough, then it does go through these various stages of uh, uh, evolution. Okay. And so you see the supernova remnants and it was quite a way back in 1934 that uh, uh, theoreticians predicted that such an event would leave behind a very compact collapsed core. Uh, which would which should be a neutron star, which is made up primarily of neutron stars. Uh, and of course, nobody knew uh, what kind of signals you may expect from such neutron stars and how would you detect them. But there, it's interesting to note that their uh, existence was predicted as back, far back as 1934. And uh, 
and so uh, the pulsar is a final uh, stage should be of, a, of an evolution of a star which is eight times more massive than a sun and uh, the uh, the supernova and all that we already talked about so uh, if you go and look at the inside of the center of what happens then uh, the uh, this again I won't go through in detail we talked about it why it reaches iron and why it stops at iron and so on but when there is iron core then you cannot produce a uh, yeah below it's written that after explosion sometimes the core of the star survives yes so not all the times we get a core inside yeah that is something that we are not very sure of okay uh, it depends on the nature of the explosion but uh, uh, the uh, in in certain situations you do get these collapsed uh, central uh, cores which are neutron stars and in the neutron stars basically uh, when you uh, go through this um, as we said earlier that the iron is the heaviest uh, element that you can synthesize without producing a uh, exothermic uh, reaction and after that uh, you cannot sustain mm -hmm. that and uh, that is when the pressure and the density rise as it starts to collapse under the force of gravity uh, and uh, at that point the material is squeezed into the form of uh, nuclei right? mm -hmm. and even free uh, protons and electrons uh, uh, can be combined to form neutrons and uh, uh, you get all the matter converted to neutrons and uh, then you get neutron degeneracy pressure which balances uh, the force of gravity and then the star exists in equilibrium right and uh, the and, and people work this out that if you do this then you should get something which is of the order of 20 kilometers in size and if you conserve the angular momentum of the original star which is rotating uh, then this should be rotating much faster than the star rotates you understand that conservation of angular momentum yes. right and similarly if you conserve uh, magnetic flux then whatever magnetic field the original star had as it collapses uh, the flux conservation would then lead to a much higher magnetic field that would be expected from neutron stars as compared to the magnetic field of a regular star like the sun right and obviously the uh, thing that we already would have recognized is that the density of this would be much higher than the density of normal matter as you know because here we do not have atoms and molecules we have everything packed into neutrons right and uh, that density is the density of the matter inside the nucleus of an atom and that can go up to 10 to the 15 grams per cc right and you ask what does that mean if you take one teaspoonful of such matter then it would uh, weigh about 1 billion tons okay so that is uh, so you say well uh, that is the kind of material that we are talking about and so effectively what happens is that within the 20 kilometer size you have as much matter as the entire sun contains about 1.4 solar mass is the typical amount of matter that is packed into a neutron star okay so uh, like i said this was all worked out from stellar evolution the theory it was predicted that such objects will exist uh, but nobody knew what to do about them uh, till they were finally discovered uh, as late as 1969 uh, and like many <coughs> discoveries in astronomy uh, this happened also by uh, accident what is called serendipitous discovery in the sense that uh, Tony Hewish and his student Jocelyn Bell they were working on an experiment to study what is called interplanetary scintillation anybody knows what is interplanetary scintillation okay so never mind we won't go into that it is something where uh, star I mean different radio sources twinkle because of the propagation of the light uh, of the signal through the inter uh, plas uh, plasma of the uh, solar system the interplanetary plasma and uh, in order to study something that is twinkling fast you need to uh, be able to record data uh, with uh, a time constant or resolution which is fast enough to see the twinkling 
right? And uh, and so they had a setup where they had a large radio telescope working at low frequencies, and they were studying interplanetary scintillation of different radio sources, quasars, and, and radio galaxies, and so on. And in the data, uh, when the chart record of the data, uh, Jocelyn Bell found these funny periodic signals like this. This is not the original thing. This is uh, some data from much later observation. If you look at the original discovery chart, you will wonder how somebody picked it up. But uh, you know, uh, she was quite uh, uh, perspicuous, and she could see these little blips uh, in in the uh, in the plot of the signal from the telescope. And uh, uh, and and uh, they discovered this. There was a lot of time spent in trying to understand what is it that they have found. The first this thing was that this must be some terrestrial source of interference coming from some man-made uh, object near the observatory which is producing these uh, signals, periodic blips because no radio source was known to have that property. Uh, but then you know there are various ways of testing all this out to see whether some signal that you are seeing at the output of a radio telescope is real coming from uh, the heavens or it's coming from some man-made source of interference and uh, that's something you also think about as to what kind of test would you do if you saw signals in the, in the output. Uh, if you see whatever experiment you're doing here, if you right. see some, and you must be seeing some extraneous signals in your output and if you try to make out how to tell whether something is really extraneous or it is really coming from some object in the sky, what kind of test would you do and how would you check that out? is something that you should think about. They did all of that and they concluded that this is really coming from the sky. And uh, so <coughs> then... Uh, we check the frequency because... Yeah, so there will be two things that will happen. Uh, uh, if we uh, do all of this, we won't reach uh, very far in the end of an hour. So uh, I'm happy to talk about it later on, but you can think about it and, and, and say what would you do if you were to try and verify whether some source is coming from the sky or, so I don't want to discourage you from asking questions, that's fine, but I will take a call on which question can be answered reasonably during the time because otherwise we won't uh, finish too much on pulsars. There's lots of interesting things and, and like I said, we can talk later on and you can come and catch me later on also. Okay, so uh, it was concluded that these are very sources in the sky and then there was a question of what can produce these. And again, because there were such clear, periodically repeating signals, the first thing was this is some uh, extraterrestrial intelligence that is signaling uh, to us. Okay, and then they were even called uh, little green men and all kinds of funny names were given. Uh, till they found, uh, again, by more investigations, that uh, there are various properties which you cannot ascribe to some uh, uh, intelligence. For example, they soon found more of these objects in the sky. Once you find four or five in different directions, you wonder how many uh, intelligent beings are out there and so on. And, and so at some point, they had to finally uh, agree that these are astrophysical objects and came down to what kind of source can produce such periodic pulsations and some of the basic properties of those, which again led to the conclusion that they are most likely rotating neutron stars. And once again, this is an interesting uh, homework exercise for you all to do, is to again look at what are the possible explanations in astrophysical sources could have existed to explain periodic signals. For example, it could be rotating white dwarf, why rotating neutron star. It could be binary stars uh, going around in orbit and then certain phases of the orbit you get signals. And, uh, and it could be pulsating stars uh, which oscillate and there are uh, optical, anybody knows RR Lyrae, what are RR Lyrae variable stars? So there are various kinds of stars which vary. Okay, but at much lower rates, so you could ask, can I get a star which is pulsating and be producing uh, these kind of pulses. And all of these were looked at and they were all ruled out. And finally, uh, they said that, look, this has to be uh, rotating neutron stars. And the closest approximation to that is what we call a lighthouse model. And the lighthouse model is what we were discussing uh, before we started. That there is a... Uh, <coughs> Uh, the neutron star is rotating around a rotation axis. It has a very strong magnetic field, most likely dipolar in st uh, structure, just like a bar magnet would produce uh, if you plot the field lines for a bar magnet. 
and that there are the, the North Pole and the South Pole and that these two are not aligned with each other and so this is going around um, uh, uh, around the rotation axis and uh, uh, and whenever this beam crosses our line of sight we see a pulse okay? and so just like a lighthouse except in a lighthouse uh, what is this angle between the rotation axis and the beam 90 degrees right that is in a neutron star it can be uh, any angle depending on uh, you know how it formed and so on so this is a kind of a uh, animated thing of uh, how you see pulses uh, every time the star is rotating okay so uh, so that brings us to observationally what you see and so what we see is periodic bursts of radio radiation uh, and you can ask what is the range of these periods and the range of periods is from few seconds down to about 1.3 milliseconds or so is the fastest known uh, rotating neutron star and they end up splitting into two categories what are called normal uh, period pulsars and millisecond period pulsars and we will see if you have time to go into the details of that but the normal period pulsars are the ones which are typically hundreds of milliseconds to few seconds in period and the millisecond pulsars are the ones where the periods are much faster of the order of milliseconds going down to few tens of milliseconds and they typically radiate quite strongly in this region of about 100 megahertz to a gigahertz or so in frequency and, uh, uh, and and they are well suited to be studied by low frequency instruments like the GMRT we will talk about that a little bit later and as somebody said in the beginning they are relatively weak uh, sources in terms of the flux so you know what is one Jansky right mm -hmm. and uh, so typical sources in the sky can be few Janskys, hundreds of Janskys, some brightest ones are thousand Janskys uh, but of course there are much weaker sources also and they happen to be in the category of typically hundreds of milli Janskys uh, in strength uh, with uh, and that is the average flux because it is a varying signal so you can ask what do you mean by the strength of that signal so it is really if you take that energy and spread it out over the entire period then how much would be the flux and that is the average flux of a pulsar and typically a sequence looks like this you get these pulses and they come periodically but you can see the pulses are not all the same like they, uh, I think it's like following a higher peak by, uh, then a lower peak then a higher peak is there something like oh, one side is stronger no it's not necessarily like that okay so there are various reasons for the peaks to vary okay and there will be times when there is no peak there is no pulse at the expected location and there are times when you will see this one component, there are times when you will see two components. I will show you a few more and then you will realize it is not as simple as that and there is much more that uh, goes behind this. So, so what if a uh, pulsar is emitting light perpendicular to the direction of our observation when there is two or there is no hope of for yes. during the pulsar? So those, that, those neutron stars would be undetectable and we do believe that there is a certain population of neutron stars which we cannot see because the beam is not uh, it, uh, is not coming towards us and that can be for a various uh, combinations the simplest being that it has own geometry it's going around but the line of sight never inter intersects us yes do the pulsar peaks uh, follow a normal or a gaussian uh, distribution can you uh, model them like that uh, not quite uh, so again this is where we will see if we can get to a little bit more detail of that a bit later <coughs> Okay, uh, then uh, like I said the basic model uh, is that the periodic train of pulses is produced by region of emission uh, which is sweeping past the line of sight once every rotation like a lighthouse beam and uh, the question is where is this emission coming from? Is it coming from the surface of the neutron star? Is it coming somewhere in the atmosphere which is called the magnetosphere? Uh, and uh, uh, and these things are things that we uh, study as part of the research try and understand where the emission is coming from we will see we will talk a little bit about it but a current understanding is that it comes somewhere up in the magnetosphere of the order of 1000 kilometers above the neutron star surface what are those jets composed of exactly sorry what are those jets composed of so these are um, uh, energetic charge particles that are streaming out from the synchrotron radiation that we see it is not synchrotron um, we still don't know exactly what the mechanism is 
so one of the things is that it is a, uh, whatever is a mechanism it has to be coherent. Uh, did you understand the difference between incoherent and coherent uh, emission mechanisms? Okay, so do you understand the difference between normal light and laser light? Mm -hmm. What is the difference? Like high What is the meaning of that? Like it remains in phase, uh, uh, constant for phase for a longer time. time. Yeah, well what does it mean for the emitting source? On the source, there are many, like for example, atoms that de excite in phase. Yeah, so the emission from the source uh, is in phase across many emitters. And that's why you can add the electric field, net received electric field in phase as compared to an incoherent emitter where you can add only the intensities uh, because the phases don't have any relationship with each other. That means there is a high directionality to it is, have a high uh, yes, so this also has high directionality uh, and, uh, uh, and these come from very highly uh, energetic charged particles which are moving at close to the speed of light. We will see, we have time to go into the theoretical details of the theoretical models which are difficult because the kind of situation there is very extreme. So, when the pulsar eventually lose its, all its energy? Hmm? So, will the pulsars and eventually lose all its energy? Yes, uh, eventually. Uh, but you can ask why and that is because there is a mechanism which is causing it to lose energy. Uh, but, uh, uh, but you know what that mechanism is. So, that mechanism comes from the fact that if you take a magnet, bar magnet and you spin it on an axis which is different from its magnetic axis just like the diagram I showed you. Uh, then uh, you produce a situation where there is a uh, time varying magnetic field. Right? If you sit at any point, you will find dB by dt happening. Right? You understand what is dB by dt? Right? So, when there is dB by dt, there will be a d by dt. Right? And so, therefore, there will be a electromagnetic wave going out at that frequency. And uh, so, there is a mechanism whereby it is losing energy. So, that electromagnetic wave carries away pointing flux for energy right? and uh, so uh, that is what is called as magnetic breaking uh, you will hear that term also and so uh, that is the basic mechanism which causes the neutron star to slow down it's losing energy this, and is, this should be true for any object in in space what do you mean by any object in space? I mean, anything that is radiating say or even a white dwarf if it's rotating and radiating um, Yes and no, if it is radiating because of some internal source of energy, uh, then it need not necessarily lose kinetic energy to do that, right? So the energy balance, right? If you have no other source of uh, energy, you are losing energy, then likely you will uh, lose kinetic energy, but it is not necessary, right? So, as the pulses slows down, the beams also get weakened? No, no, no. Why, why should that happen? No, okay. Right, it is not necessary. So, there is there's a lot of uh, complicated and detailed physics here which we can't uh, hope to do in one hour but I am happy you all have lots of questions but uh, uh, the thing is that it is correct that pulsars slow down and that is something we will come to um, and actually what I will do is I will I will skip this part about what do we do for observing pulsars uh, except that we use radio telescopes to study pulsars. Now, I do not know how much you have understood about how a radio telescope uh, work, how a single dish works and how an interferometer works. Are you clear about that? So, what is the main reason for building an interferometer? Right. So, what do you think would be the resolution needed to see this emission coming from uh, 1000 kilometer high to the neutron star? So, do this homework, work out this number and uh, come back and tell me later on how much it turns out to be. You will find that it is not possible to uh, resolve this by any of these interferometers. Okay. It is uh, very, 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 very small. Okay. Uh, and uh, so, you can ask what do you do with the interferometer uh, when you are faced with studying a pulsar. So, effectively pulsars are point sources. Right? A point source for any instrument means that it is unresolvable by the resolving capability of that instrument. Right? So, uh, it will still look like a dot when you make an image hmm? and uh, uh, therefore, uh, you can ask, uh, if you give me interferometer, what do I do to study pulsars? 
and you dance was the simplest thing you can do is to say well there are 30 antennas they are all collecting the signal let me just add it at least I will get the equivalent of 30 antennas collected together okay um, and uh, you can uh, and so there is therefore I don't know if you went to GMRT you, you got this from the discussions there that there are two modes in which the instrument operates which is that uh, uh, so this I won't talk because I think you've been to GMRT and you've seen some of the things uh, but what I do wanted to talk is that uh, what you, I don't know whether you came across this that there are two modes of operation of this GMRT one is the normal interferometry aperture synthesis mode where we try to get this resolution that you all were talking about by doing this specific operation of uh, doing this pairwise multiplication of the signals from all the antennas. Have you gone through that kind of a yes. discussion? Yes. Right? Uh, whereas in the other mode, you just take the voltage signals from all the antennas and you add them. And you have to add them in phase, you have to correct for the phases of the signals before you add them uh, and try to make it look like one large single dish. Okay. Uh, and uh, and that's uh, and then you keep the highest time resolution that is possible because as we saw these are objects which vary on time scales of seconds to milliseconds and you really want to see the structure within a pulse what does it look like and we will come to that later on and uh, there, that requires the data to be taken at very high time resolution ok so we will come back to uh, neutron stars and see that uh, we have discussed some of this already uh, but the important thing to note is that they are very extreme objects ok and uh, uh, they are extreme like we said about 10 to 20 kilometers in size at densities 10 to the 14 or higher and we already talked about this uh, spinning rapidly seconds to milliseconds and these uh, this rotation is very stable and accurate ok although it is slowing down uh, but you can measure the rotation of a neutron star to an accuracy of 1 part in 10 to the 12. What does that mean? Supposing the neutron star had a period of 1.5 seconds, uh, what does 1 part in 10 to the 12 mean? 1.5 into 10 to the That means if I write down the period, what will it look like? 1.5 plus minus uh, 10 to the 12. Because minus 12. 10 minus 12 minus 12. This is a minus 12 decimal place. Ah, so if I write see. it down, how many, uh, with what? Uh, accuracy can I write down the period and how many zeros uh, I put? No, 12 zeros after the decimal yes. place. So that means you know the period to accuracy of 1.5000000 something, right? Yeah. Okay. And so you can ask, can you measure any quantity to that accuracy? Nine. Huh? We can rival clocks. Huh, sorry? You can measure time. Hmm? You can replace the clocks like the, like you use it to define the like, uh, yeah, but you have to make sure that it has all the properties to do that, right? We we may be able to do it, but it has uh, been talked about, but it has not been shown to be a practical reality for various reasons. Okay, but the more important thing is that you can ask, you know, to measure a quantity with that accuracy. How do you do it? Okay, uh, never mind that if you do measure it that accuracy, you can have a time standard. The question is, how do you do that? And that's an interesting thing to think about. And I don't know when you went to JMRT, whether anybody talked to you about how these things are done. Okay, that what is the measurements that are done in order to be able to determine a quantity with that kind of accuracy? How do you do this? Okay. Um, and that of course brings the question that if you're doing this with a clock to time the things, how accurate is your clock? Is it accurate enough to be able to measure something to that accuracy? And then that question comes as you were saying that. If it is not that good, then can I use these signals as a clock? But that's a different uh, subject. Okay, and again, they have very high uh, temperatures and a very high magnetic field. Which the theoretical expectation of that comes from what we talked about earlier, the conservation of flux. But there's an actual way of estimating the magnetic field, uh, which I'll see if we get around to that. Which comes from this: um, if you work out that what is it, the formula which decides the breaking of this uh, dipole which is spinning on a different axis, you will find that that, uh, uh, that loss of energy uh, is proportional to the magnetic dipole moment uh, that is present because that is what is causing the dv by dt. Okay. And uh, uh, most of them emit strongly in radio waves but some of them are known to emit 
X rays and optical radiation also, like the crab nebula, uh, sorry, the crab pulsar is seen in optical. And there are a reasonable number today that are seen that all of this works properly as the star collapses and that you can uh, preserve and uh, amplify the field. That's a different uh, topic as to how the theory works. Now, the interesting thing is that neutron stars also have strong gravity, right? If you can imagine if you were at the surface of the neutron star, you would feel the same gravitational uh, effect like the sun pulling you, except that at the sun you can never get to 10 kilometers, right? Uh, the sun size itself is much bigger. Uh, and, and so, uh, so, now, so that's the important point. You may say, well, it's not a very massive object, it's about the mass of the sun. So what are you talking about it having much stronger gravitational field? It is because you can come much closer to it. So you remember no, your GMM over R square, okay? So the R is much smaller here than you can ever get in any practical situation. Okay, so as a result, your small g goes up uh, tremendously, right? And uh, so you should compare this with our, what do we have at Earth? 9.8 or something, right? Okay, so uh, now you can ask the simple question that any particle, suppose you put a charged particle at the neutron star surface, it will feel both gravitational force and if it is moving at some speed v, it will have electromagnetic force also, right? Which is what? V cross B, right? Yeah, right. So when you do that calculation for a simple uh, thing, uh, you find that the magnetic field is so strong that it dominates by 10 to the 13 times the. You would have thought that look, we have gone to the highest gravitational field that's possible. Okay, but then there is a force which is much stronger than that that is acting over there. Okay, so what this tells you is that what happens in the magnetosphere of the neutron star is pretty much dictated by the magnetic field and not by the gravitational field, although you would have thought that, okay, but we will see that gravitational field has its own effect on other objects which come near to the neutron star and that is where uh, you learn about, uh, you know, binary pulsars and what you learn from them and, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity and how you verify it and so on and so forth, okay. So, the thing to take away from this, from our one hour lecture is that the magnetic field is the boss here, it controls what happens, how the plasma <coughs> is generated, how the plasma is accelerated, how you get charged particles which accelerate and emit radiation, okay. I do not think we can do more than that in this introductory lecture, but again this is the basic picture that you could uh, go home with, uh, which is the neutron star, it is strong magnetic field lines and charged particles which are somehow generated, which we will not have time to go into the details and, uh, and uh, uh, the basic picture is then uh, this that uh, there is a region of the magnetosphere which uh, contains open field lines and this is a concept which again is not very easy to get but it is not that difficult. So if you are uh, charged, if you are a particle on this field line, you are rotating around the star at some speed, right? That speed is uh, V is equal to R omega, right? So as you keep increasing R, uh, the V will keep going up. At some point, V can be equal to C. So then you say, well, at some point, something has to give. You cannot be going around faster than C, even if you are rotating around a neutron star. So you say, wait, what? V equal to C? That must be very far away, right? If you take omega of the Earth and ask, how far do you have to go to from co-rotating with the Earth to reach the speed of light? It's a huge distance. Okay, but here that's not the case because omega is much faster, okay, uh, it is going around once a second and uh, therefore this distance, uh, what is called the light cylinder radius uh, happens within uh, thousands of kilometers, okay. So what that means is that if you had particles attached to the field line, then this cannot be a stable geometry where they are rotating faster. So up to some distance as possible, beyond that uh, these field lines then become open and you can ask what do you mean by field lines which are open uh, and that is a concept to be thought about but basically what it means is that there is current that can flow along this part of the magnetosphere and particles can escape from the magnetosphere whereas here in this region of the closed field line the particles will be bound here if they are present in the magnetosphere, okay. And again there is not enough time in the introductory lecture to go into that but the basic theoretical models that we have which are not complete and they do not have a full explanation of what happens in a pulsar 
magnetosphere uh, believe that the emission comes from this open field line region which is called the polar cap uh, which is around the north and south poles of the neutron star and that the radio emission is generated at some height uh, above the neutron star surface from highly energetic charged particles possibly radiating in phase to produce current beam of emission uh, by a mechanism which is probably similar to the family of uh, effects like synchrotron or curvature radiation and so on, it is not exactly that. Okay. And uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, and the radiation which is emitted is normally it is beam is highly directional uh, with the beaming angle which depends on the gamma or the speed of the particles and the opening angle is 1 over gamma but is beam tangential to the field line and it goes out. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and then that uh, then with that we can try to understand a little bit more about the nature of the signals from the uh, neutron star. So, Sir, I showed you, yes? In the particles in the closed field lines which are moving at the relativistic speed, you should see some kind of uh, synchrotronic ra radiations from those also. It is not necessary uh, if they are in some uh, stable configuration. Uh, then they may not radiate. So, there are some <coughs> models where people talk about certain kind of radiation that may be possible. Okay. And again, like I said, we probably can't go into all of the details here, uh, but you do need a, a, a constantly, uh, uh, so the uh, that acceleration is different from the acceleration we are talking about when the particle is streaming along a curved field line. Okay. And so, there is a difference in that nature and that is the kind that gives rise to the radio wave propagation or uh, radio waves that we see, right. And the other one is the one that is producing your dB by dt and dE by dt and you see, so th you must remember that uh, if you do that, uh, the basic thing whereby the pulsar is losing energy, we said there is an electromagnetic wave, what will be the frequency of that electromagnetic wave? Well, depending on the magnetic field of the pulsar. With, uh, Depend on the yeah. frequency of that wave will be the frequency of rotation of the rotation. Right. So, if the pulsar is going around once a second, that electromagnetic wave will have a frequency of 1 hertz. Okay. Uh, where is 1 hertz? Okay. 1 hertz is uh, you know way down in the spectrum somewhere. We are talking about electromagnetic waves at megahertz, tens of megahertz, hundreds of megahertz, thousands of megahertz. They are generated by a different mechanism. That is the mechanism where charged particles are accelerated along the field line. So, there are there are different things going on in the pulsar magnetosphere, that is something we must understand and the bulk of the energy loss is from this electromagnetic dipole radiation. Okay. Uh, so, uh, now there are many other interesting things in a pulsar signal uh, which uh, you can see and one of them is called dispersion. Again, I do not know if you have come across that so far in your 10 days or, or not, but uh, when you have uh, any plasma and you have electromagnetic wave traveling through the plasma, uh, there is something called dispersion, right. Uh, you have seen light being dispersed, right. Uh, when you get um, a prism giving you a spectrum, that is dispersion, right. Uh, and uh, so, whenever, and so there are certain media where the omega k relationship for electromagnetic wave is not a simple thing where uh, uh, you have the direct proportionality, but you can get a frequency dependent uh, behavior. So, what happens is that the diff, uh, so this is a plot showing different radio frequencies over a narrow range of bands, say about from 300 uh, uh, over some range, the different frequencies travel at different speeds through the ionized plasma of the galaxy, uh, which is lying in between us and the neutron star. And as a result of it, the different frequencies arrive at different times and if you do not correct for this and you just add that signal from the different frequencies in your radio frequency band, then you will get a profile which is <coughs> smeared out. Right? If you just add all of these, you will get something broad like here. So, what you have to do is you have to correct for this uh, delayed arrival at different frequencies and then add them up to get a, uh, a sharp pulse like this. And uh, and that is called de dispersion, and this is a standard part of the pulsar signal processing. And the total 
uh, the measure of how much a pulsar signal will be dispersed is called the dispersion measure and it depends on the total uh, density of plasma along the line of sight between us and the pulsar which can be different for different pulsars in the galaxy. So, you would expect if a pulsar is nearer to us it will have less dispersion, if a pulsar is much further from us it will have more dispersion because it is seeing more of the plasma in the galaxy, right. So, uh, this is just something to keep in mind and uh, the other thing to look at is that and which I showed you in the very first plot that the individual pulses they look highly different from each other and you ask what is this business you say they come periodically how can I tell that when I can't even see the same pulse coming successively and uh, there is an interesting question. So, uh, it is seen that in general so what you have done here is we have taken individual pulses and cut them and put them one below the others like stacking and when you add them up you get a signal which is called the average signal average profile and it has some significance because if you do this at any time for any pulsar you will get a typical shape of that uh, pulse for that pulsar. So, although individual pulses may vary a lot from pulse to pulse when you combine a reasonably large number of them typically a few hundred to thousand pulses you get some kind of a stable shape okay, uh, which is called the average profile of that pulsar and each pulsar has its own shape we will see a little bit more about that and uh, these shapes also change with frequency that also we will see a little bit later and this is like a signature okay and it is this which is the stable pulse shape and this is the one we are talking about that if you measure the peak of this and you measure the peak of this again 2 hours later then that separation in time will be some multiple of the period of the pulsar okay uh, although individual pulses fluctuate a lot. And the, what it tells you is that the whatever is the basic process which causes emission is some sporadic process. Uh, unlike your lighthouse beam where the bulb is on a rock steady and every time it comes by you will see exactly the same profile from the light from the, uh, from the uh, lighthouse. Just imagine the lighthouse instead of uh, the traditional light today most of the lights are uh, multiple LEDs right. Just imagine a lighthouse which has multiple LEDs in its this thing and these LEDs are randomly flickering some LED is on at some point another one is on at another time some uh, thing random is going on and this thing is sweeping by Then every time when you it goes by you will see some combination of LEDs being on and it will give you some particular uh, set of signals but if you add all of them together then you will get the average thing where every LED was on right and that will give you then the overall shape of the distribution of the LEDs in that lamp. So, it is a bit like that not exactly but again we can only give reasonable analogies right now till you get deeper into the subject and then try and understand what it does. So, uh, these uh, typically uh, you can get pulses have different shapes ok and again we will not go into the details of that but uh, these signatures are different for different pulsars. Uh, but uh, one of the things we skipped over is that the period uh, uh, the signal is periodic but it has a very narrow duty cycle. Uh, what is meant by duty cycle? Total time for which the period is high divided by the time for the exactly. So, the duty cycle is nothing but the ratio of the duration of the pulse to the uh, period of the repetition of the pulse right. So, narrow duty cycle means some signal which is very brief uh, compared to its period and um, uh, wide or a large duty, uh, uh, low duty cycle is where the signal is more evenly spread out like for example, your sine wave is a you know is a slow duty cycle because it is on for a good fraction of the, of the period. Um, there is rectangular pulses the delta function is very narrow and it can be repeating. Mm -hmm. So, pulsars typically have a duty cycle which is about 10 percent 5 to 10 percent that means most of the time there is no signal except for this small duration when the pulse comes on. So, this again is like the lighthouse most of the time you see nothing except for a brief duration when the beam sweeps by ok uh, and like I said we will not go into the details of what this means, but it tells that most likely so this is like this that uh, you know the again going by the LED analogy that maybe there are just 5 different LEDs in this lamp and you see them uh, which they have different strength for some reason and uh, there are different combinations for different pulsars. Uh, that is a, a very large area of research which I would not go into 
and uh, but when you do all of that, it comes out with this inference that these things must be located as as discrete entities in the magnetosphere at a certain height above the neutron star surface, and that at different frequencies these regions are slightly differently located in the magnetosphere. But again, let's not go into all that. Um, there are lots of very interesting things which I will skip over because this will take a lot of time to explain and understand. Uh, but there is one thing that you can uh, we should think a little bit about as we said that the uh, pulsars emit from 100 to gigahertz, 100 to megahertz to gigahertz and every object has a spectrum right this you would have come across whether it is a nebula or it is a galaxy or whatever and spectrum means how does the strength of the signal change as a function of radio frequency. And so pulsars also have spectrum and typically the spectrum is what we call a non-thermal spectrum, non-thermal spectrum is a spectrum where the strength of the signal uh, increases as you go to low frequencies uh, with a certain slope on a log log plot right this kind of thing you are familiar with yes. huh? and so uh, there is something called a spectral index that is at what rate the signal is changing with frequency and pulsars have generally fairly steep spectral index uh, minus 1 to minus 3 kind of a range uh, which means that the slope of this is that much on a log log plot and uh, they typically uh, there is generally some evidence that at very low frequency like 100 megahertz or around that the spectrum actually turns over and starts to fall again like, like you can see over here and uh, sometimes at high frequencies it may have another break and, and change the slope but by uh, one by a 2 gigahertz or so they become relatively weak compared to their strength at 100 of megahertz. But like we did not do this but you can work this out but if you take this energy that we are seeing and put it in that region of a thousand kilometers in size and then you ask what is the uh, brightness temperature, I do not know if you have come across the concept of brightness temperature, then you will find that the brightness temperature is very large and that is what leads to this inference that it cannot be an incoherent emission mechanism, it has to be a coherent emission mechanism. Sir, so what yes. are the different uh, curves correspond to, there are three curves I can see. There are just three examples of different pulsars. Different pulsars. Yes. Yeah. Just to show you. Uh, typical uh, variation, typical kind of spectra that you get. Okay, um, hmm, polarization, uh, are you all familiar with polarization? Okay, because uh, otherwise uh, one would not want to go too deep into it. Okay, who will explain what is polarization? Very quickly, in one yeah. sentence. Like it is the uh, yeah. locus of the tip of the e field. Electromagnetic. Locus of the tip of the electric e field. The electric field oscillates in a given plane. Yes. So, the, yes. The, so, the, so the polarization basically tells you about the uh, behavior of the uh, direction in which the electric field is oscillating. Mm -hmm. And you different people give different answers that electric field oscillates in a given plane, somebody says the tip of the electric field vector, but they are all related. And basically, you want to know how the tip of the electric field vector is moving. Is it moving like this? Is it moving like this? or what and as the electromagnetic wave comes to you right and uh, the uh, polarization is very important way of studying the properties of radio sources because polarization tells you about what process would have caused that emission okay and it needs a certain uh, any charge particle to emit and radiate and give you polarized radiation the, it needs to behave in a particular manner okay so again, I won't go into the details of this because it's a bit, a bit sophisticated. But the fact is that pulsars are highly polarized. You can measure the polarization. You can see whether the electric field vector when you receive it is doing this or is doing this or some elliptical waveform. And from that, you can infer certain properties about the uh, emission region. Okay, the fact that it is coming from the pole of a magnetic um, uh, pole. Uh, is inferred from the polarization properties. Okay, uh, we jumped it. We just showed that it is coming from the uh, pole of the uh, the magnetic pole. You could ask, how do you know that? And that answer comes from studying the polarization properties. Sir, it's coming uh, across large uh, distances of light years, uh, crossing the interstellar medium. So uh, there are lots of things inside, uh, in between. So mm -hmm. uh, can't the polarization change? Mm -hmm. Like what? What do you expect can happen? Like I expect it to change. Because in what way? 
it's even okay. it's in, in, uh, interacting with the atmosphere so yeah. so it is correct that uh, what you said is right that uh, there can be modifications so just like a dispersion which is an effect produced by the intervening medium uh, which causes the different frequencies to travel at different speeds and therefore arrive at different times uh, the interstellar medium if it has magnetic field in it uh, can change the direction of the polarization and the most simplest effect is called Faraday rotation. Are you familiar with Faraday rotation? No, right. Okay, so the, the, again in a one hour lecture there is only so much one can do, I am already out of the time uh, but basically that if you have a magnetized plasma and you have an electromagnetic wave propagating through it then the uh, direction of oscillation of the electric field can systematically change its direction as the wave propagates through the plasma because the interaction of the electric field vector of the wave with the magnetic field and the charged particles in the plasma. Okay, that's all I can say now. <laughs> again, if you so, but again, we see you are here to pick up ideas and things that you can follow up, right? There is only so much that can be covered in detail in two weeks. So you you can go and read more about what is Faraday rotation and how magnetized plasma uh, in the galaxy can affect the propagation of the radio wave through it, and what we can learn from it. So that's the important thing. You can learn interesting properties of the interstellar medium from, from that as well as as you said it affects the received signal and it can change it and you have to be careful to understand that the signal has been modified and what should be done right okay so um, uh, so I will skip over some of the details I will certainly skip over this this is the most difficult part about the theoretical models and this goes into uh, extreme physics and uh, which is not possible to cover. I will talk about this because this is something which is interesting and very fascinating. It's called that timing. And uh, as we discussed, these pulses arrive with very regular, in a regular manner. You can ask, how do I know that? Right? So to do that, you must be able to measure the number of the pulses. Then only can you make any inference. And uh, to do that, you need a reasonably accurate clock at the observatory. So. Uh, and so all you have to do is when you have the signal that is coming as a function of time and you can tag it that this particular intensity value came at this time, this particular intensity is at this time which you can do because you have the data that you are recording, you are capturing the data and you can say I started capturing the data at exactly this time in my clock and every sample in the data can be tagged. Okay. And just by this simple thing you can do all kinds of uh, interesting and fascinating things. One is of course you can infer whether the period of the pulsar is changing. Right? So you say what does that mean? That means that if the pulsar is slowing down then the interval, average interval between pulses will keep going up. Right? So if you measure this average profile now and you measure it a little bit later, again a little bit later, then you will find that the time that you ascribe to this average profile uh, and the time you of arrival you ascribe to the one later on and to the one later on will not change monotonically as the integer number of periods that have gone by. Okay. And uh, then, so and then you can fit a more complicated model which says that the period is slowly changing with time and can I estimate the rate of change of period, the dp by dt. And that is how we learn that pulsars are slowing down. Okay. And uh, but, you, you know, the question to ask is what is this interval, how often do you have to measure? And it, you can again show that yourself that if the pulsar is slowing down at some rate, let us say one part in 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 15 or whatever, then you need to do this measurement over periods of weeks to months in order to see a perceptible change in the period of the pulsar. Okay. So uh, that is one simple thing that you can do. Now the other thing that can happen, uh, which you, you just have to couple this with one other fact. So when you receive periodic signal from something it is like a periodic uh, emitter, it is like a whistle. Okay. So what happens if you put a whistle on a moving object? You get the shock. Right? And so uh, if the pulsar is moving with respect to us with some velocity, then this apparent period, the separation between the pulses can change. Okay. So now you have a very powerful uh, tool uh, which you can use uh, and when you think about it, it is just not the pulsar can be moving, we can be moving with respect to the pulsar and so this period is sensitive to any relative motion 
between the source and the observer, just like in Doppler shift, right? You can be on the train or you can be on the ground. The, the, you know, the both sides will see the Doppler shift uh, of uh, the other object that is emitting. So you can, uh, and, and I won't go into the details of this, but this is something that you can see now with just these two facts, that the ability to measure accurately the arrival of the pulses and the fact that this periodicity of the pulses can be changed due to motions uh, between us and the pulsar allows you to do a huge amount of inference of various things, uh, which I can't go into the detail, but it ranges from being able to study, of course, how the pulsar is moving in the sky, in the galaxy, to uh, what is the uh, more correct location of the pulsar because the earth is moving around the sun periodically in six months and you can measure the Doppler shift, parallax. You know about parallax? Right? So you can do the equivalent of a parallax kind of a thing over here and you can learn lots of interesting things. More interesting if the pulsar is in a binary orbit with another star and then you can learn about its motion around the center of gravity. And that opens up a huge uh, uh, potential of things that you can learn. And uh, uh, okay, so these are the details of how you do all these measurements and how you model the arrival time of the pulses. Again, there's no time to go into it. And again, this is something that you can read and try to understand that how do you do this modeling uh, of what is happening to the arrival time of the pulses and what all can be fitted into that model in order to understand the various phenomena that are going on. Okay. And uh, once again, I will not go into the technical details of how you measure the difference between the model and your data. But what is interesting for you all to go away with is that you can do interesting things like this, that uh, when you have binary systems and uh, the neutron star is going around the center of gravity in a binary orbit, then you can measure the parameters of this binary orbit. What is the period of the neutron star around uh, the now this is not the rotation period, huh? this is a revolution period around the center of gravity and therefore what is the size of the orbit, is, what is the orientation of the orbit, some of these things you can start to get. More interesting is that if this orbit is changing slowly due to time, evolving, then you can see this evolution. You can ask what can cause the orbit to evolve and then that is where we get into more fundamental physics. I think some of you have heard that people have tried to study the advance of Perry Astron for Mercury from uh, the uh, uh, theory of relativity and uh, things like uh, Einstein delay, shrinking of orbits due to loss of energy by emission of gravitational waves. Okay, so now we are getting into a really exotic physics as to uh, what are gravitational waves, how can a binary system lose energy due to gravitational waves, when it loses energy what happens to the orbit of the binary system, can you measure such changes. All of that is possible from pulsar timing. And uh, the uh, living evidence of that is a Nobel Prize which is uh, given to Hudson Taylor who discovered this first, uh, one of the earlier binary pulsars and they just studied this timing of the pulses from this pulsar for 20 years, okay. We talked about weeks to months, 20 years of data. So you see 1975 to extended further to 30 years, 2005. What were they measuring? They were measuring how the orbit is slowly changing with time in this binary pulsar. And they showed that this is what is happening to the shift of the peri uh, periastron of the orbit as a function of time. And these are their, their data and the solid line is the best fit model from the theory of gravity. Okay. So what they showed is Einstein's theory is correct up to this level that it explains the behavior in such a system. So there is a test you cannot do anywhere. You can't do it in your lab, you can't do it with Mercury's advance in perihelion because Mercury never gets to the, uh, so close to the sun as these two objects are getting there, they come within 1000 kilometers of each other as the orbits as they are going around in the binary orbits, okay. So that is the kind of uh, potential that this opens up and that's why people are interested in finding more pulsars and binaries and so on. Okay, I think I will stop now because we'll, we are well above time. I mean the last part was just about how pulsars are distributed in a galaxy and, and so on, but that's, I think that's not so and about binary pulsars and evolution. But uh, I think we'll stop. If you have a few more questions, I'll take that. Otherwise, we will, uh, otherwise we'll continue for two, three hours. Okay. All right, any questions, immediate, any burning things? So, so these, uh, 
pulse profile change uh, for different frequencies like we observe at 300 megahertz? Yes, they do. I didn't go through the detail, but in general, for normal pulsars, as you go to low frequency, the pulse profile becomes wider and wider. So that, you know, I said it's like 10% duty.